as we begin a new year, oftentimes at the beginning of the year, uh, personally, I just like for us to dive a little bit deeper. And, and there are things that I like to dive into relating our own souls and even related to what that video talks about. How do we actually begin to experience God at, at, at deeper levels? How do we actually encounter him? Um, over the Christmas break, I had the, the chance to read uh, just some things I hadn't read for a while, kind of went back and, and visited some old books and some old things that, that I hadn't seen, hadn't seen for a bit. And one of them was um, some of the journals, some of the writings of John Muir. And uh, those of you that maybe don't know who John Muir is, he's one of the more famous North American modern explorers. He was very well known for exploring up and down the West Coast from the Sierra Nevadas up into Alaska. And he kept journals of his adventures. And I was reading this one particular um, place in one of his journals where he had visited a friend who had a cabin in the Yuba River Valley in the Sierra Nevadas. And he was using that cabin as sort of a launching point out into different places. He was staying there for several weeks. And John Muir tells a story that one particular night he was sitting in the cabin and there was a storm that was moving in from the Pacific and it was rolling up the canyons and into the Nevadas. And as he was listening to the wind, he began to just hear the trees swaying and he started to smell the, the, the distinct smell of the rain as it was touching the dust and touching the ground. And then all of the sights, the lightning and the thunder. And at one point in his journal, he actually says this. He actually says, and where would I be safer? In the confines of a cabin or out in the wilds? And as you read that, my thought is, well, in the cabin, right? Um, John Muir is like, not much safer. And so he literally tells the story of opening the door into this vicious storm, going out into it, and then he begins up the canyon. And he climbs through the brush and the trees, and he makes his way up to the top of this particular hill. And there was a stand of Douglas firs, and he climbs to the top of one of the tallest Douglas firs and literally holds on for dear life and experiences the remainder of the storm, swaying and being blown by the wind. There's this kaleidoscope of color and noise and sound and feeling and smells. And, and all of it was so that he could experience it in its fullness. And as I was reading that, I was just thinking of that experience. I started asking other questions and I started wondering, I started thinking, how many of us are living our lives in full color? How many of us are living our lives where we're experiencing life in all of the dimensions that we were intended to experience? How, how many of us are, are smelling the smells and seeing the sights? How many of us are, are experiencing the motion of what it means to be truly alive in this world? And as I think about that, um, I, I started wondering, like, what if the habits... What if the routines of our life, what if the way we've sort of structured our days, the way we kind of go through life, what if the way we have structured life has actually forced us to live in black and white rather than color? And what if just beyond what we're experiencing, there's more? What if just beyond that, there's something that's more dynamic and more beautiful and more vivid? See, I, I have this tendency to think that we know that there's more. I, I don't care where you are in your journey of faith, if you're new to it, if you're exploring it, if you've been doing it for years, I think there's this deep thing inside of us, many of us, that says there has got to be more to my experience than just moving through these rhythms and habits that I've established for myself. There have to be dimensions and colors that are yet to be experienced. I think that's what we long for. But, but what, if, what if we discovered that where we find that color, where we find that vividness is not in another uh, academic achievement. It isn't in some other intellectual realization. It isn't going to come through some sort of uh, financial gain, like another zero in our checking account or a promotion at work. What if it's not through some more moment of pleasure? What if the key to experiencing the more that God has for us is actually way more accessible than we ever imagined? What if we could experience that? What if everybody could experience this? See, this, this picture of John Muir, the top of the Douglas tree, Douglas fir, it's this image, I think, that describes our situation or our potential situation. God has more for us. God has more for us, and we can experience our creator. We can experience the color. We can experience the wind of God's spirit moving through our lives. We can see God at work in our, in our time. The storm is out there, but we literally have to open the doors of this comfortable place of routine that we found ourselves to experience the wildness of God at work in the world. In order for us to find the freedom, in order for us to find the life, we have to enter into the storm and experience something beyond what we presently are. And so for the next few weeks, um, what we're really doing in this series is offering an invitation or an opportunity to just bring some color and some excitement back to our lives. Does anybody need some color and excitement? Yeah, 
Yeah, a lot of us do, right? We're going to bring some color back to our life. We're going to just open the door a little bit, right? We're going to crack the door. We're going to step out. And we're going, to, and we're going to take some risk. But what's interesting about this is we're going to risk by moving in a direction that you might already be familiar with. In fact, here's the deal. If you look at Christian spirituality, the core of Christian spirituality, and you say, well, what is at the center of this? Where do you really begin to climb that tree and experience the movement and the wind of God? Where does this happen? You, you actually see two practices over and over again through Christian history. They're the practices of prayer and fasting. It's fascinating to me. Um, for centuries, this is the centerpiece of Christian spirituality. Every great man or woman, um, the, the church fathers, the mystics, the apostles, Jesus himself, they all fasted and prayed. And, and yet, Ironically, for most modern, sort of enlightened, intellectual Christians, we actually don't consider this a practical practice, right? I mean, we, we kind of discard this, and then we wonder, well, why don't I feel really alive in my faith? Why don't I experience these things? In fact, I'll just admit this. Now, when I think about my life, the hurry and the busy and all the stuff that I wake up every day having to do just like you, prayer and fasting are not things that stay on the front burner of my life very easily. Are you with me on this? In fact, I mean, I jokingly say this, but there are days when prayer does not seem like a very practical choice, right? Like, oh, I got so many things to do. How in the world am I going to stop and pray? Like, that seems like a very impractical, maybe not even a responsible thing to do, right? I'm going to say that in church just so that you can too, right? This is an honest place, right? It just seems tough at times to go, yeah, I'm going to pause and do this. Not only that, I think prayer gets complicated when we pray um, there are all sorts of questions. In the Be With Jesus series, one of the weeks is on prayer, and I express some of my own concerns. Like, does God some, hear some prayers and not others? Does God answer some prayers and not others? What, what's, what's going on with that? And like, why do we pray? There's all sorts of complications. Uh, I was thinking this week, like, why we don't pray, and so I wrote a couple things down. I, I said, some people don't pray because they don't want to discover that God is actually there. Other people don't pray because they're afraid that he might not be. I mean, isn't that true? Like some people, they go, man, I don't want to pray because if I pray and then God is actually out there, well, that's going to mess with my world, right? I don't want to have to submit to anybody else's leadership in my life. I don't want to be led by anyone but me. And if I pray and God is actually there, well, that's just going to change things, right? So right now it's very comfortable kind of knowing but not really talking to him. That way there's, we're not messing with stuff. That way I don't have to tell my friends, yeah, I was led by God. And they go, what are you talking about? Well, I was praying and then led by, that doesn't play well at the water cooler or on the basketball basketball court, does it? I was led by God. What does that even look like, right? And so I don't want to pray because I don't want to find out that God's there because that'll mess with me. Or some people really say like, man, if, what happens if I pray? What happens if I put myself out there and this faith that I believe in that's kind of maybe held together with a, with a shoestring, but it's giving me some peace and some hope. What if I pray and it's crickets on the other side? Then What? And so we don't pray. And as a result of this, we miss out on all the color and the sight and the sounds of doing life with God. So this morning, what I want to do is just give sort of an introduction to prayer. That's just a reminder for some of us, maybe some refreshing new news for others of you. But for me, it's just some stuff that I need to be encouraged with. So I want to talk about three things. I want to talk about the precursor to prayer. I want to talk about the posture of prayer. And then I want to talk about the practice of prayer. So the first thing, the precursor to prayer. And to do this, I want to dive into Psalm chapter 104. Um, the Psalms often give us insights to prayer, what it looks like to talk to God. And in the middle of Psalm chapter 104, the psalmist says this. Verse 27, he says, These all look to you, speaking about humanity, these all look to you to give them their food in due season. When you give it to them, they gather it up. And when you open your hand, they're filled with good things. When you hide your face, they're dismayed. And when you take away their breath, they die and they return to their dust. Really encouraging stuff this morning, I know. Then verse 30 says, when you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the ground. So I choose these verses because I want you to catch that there is this rhythm of relationship with God and creation of life. And it's the last part that I really want you to hold on to. When you send forth your spirit, they are created and you renew the face of the dust. Like, I don't know about you. I don't think there's anything more lifeless or dead than dust. And yet somehow God's spirit renews the dust, like brings life to something that was lifeless. 
This, what is being described in these verses is this creative, life-giving process through which transformation occurs. This is where life happens. When I'm filled with the Spirit of God, I'm renewed. I'm made alive. That's what's being described here. And by the way, let me just point out, when I say alive, I'm talking about more than just the biological categories of what it means to be alive, right? Right? Whenever we in our culture talk about someone like, man, that person is really living life to its fullest. When, when somebody's really alive, we're not just saying they have low blood pressure and a low resting heart rate, right? When you're alive, we talk about life in real terms. We're not talking about biological measures of life. We're talking about something beyond that, right? Like when we talk about life, we say life like somebody's alive. We're, we're talking about matters of joy, we're talking about matters of, 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 of meaning. We're talking about matters of love, matters of purpose, matters of truth, matters of beauty, matters of virtue. We're talking about those sort of intangible things that when they're all together, seem to bring together a vibrancy that says that is what it looks like to be alive. When we talk about alive and life, those are the sort of things we're talking about. And when the psalmist speaks of God's spirit, or the Hebrew word is the ruach, of God being given, this is what is delivered. When God's spirit falls on people, you don't get a pulse, you get life. And, and when we see joy and love and faith and hope and truth and beauty and meaning and value, and we see all of these things, we also see God's spirit at work in that person. There is this relationship between this stuff that we call real life and the Spirit of God. This is why David in Psalm 51, at one point he's in this moment of, of just confessing to God his own brokenness, and he says, take not your spirit from me. There's this awareness. David's like, listen, I know my life is sort of lifeless and meaningless if God's spirit isn't upon me. So he's pleading with God, God, don't let your spirit be taken from me. Because there's a relationship between the spirit of God and being alive. And, and what I want you to understand is kind of a precursor to prayer is that before God ever calls you into conversation with him, he calls you into relationship. Before God ever calls you into conversation, he calls you into relationship. And what we're talking about here is God's life and our life coming together, a union, a joining his spirit joining our spirit in relationship before God ever calls you into conversation, before God ever says, hey, would you give me your opinion on how you think things should be going? <laughs> before you ever come to God and say, "Can you like, would you just tell me what you want from life and maybe I'll think about it. Before you ever enter into conversation with God, he wants you to be in relationship first. Now, why is that important? Some of us are going, well, that seems obvious, doesn't it? It really isn't that obvious. And here's why. Somewhere along the way, we human beings, and I talk about us collectively, we human beings, we have picked up this very strange and bad habit of trying to acquire this so-called life, the joy, the peace, the meaning, the beauty, all these, the virtue, all these different things. We've tried to do this on our terms without all the bother of God or the inconvenience of his spirit. Like we, we sort of decided like, we don't want to have to bother with somebody else being God and take orders from somebody else. And so in a very sort of individualistic, uh, American sort of way, we've just said, what if I just bypass God and I go for the life stuff without him? So we'll just kind of get rid of all the like sacrifice and, and the confession and the repentance and the inconvenience and the submission. Let's just forget all that stuff and we'll just get it on our own. Not, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's completely godless. In fact, um, what we actually do is we turn God into a being who stays mostly in the background and is a resource when we get desperate. That's what God becomes for us. God becomes a being that provides occasional good ideas and energy that we can take charge of and arrange as we see fit. But that's not a relationship. And that never leads to life. We actually never get what we're looking for when we leave the relationship with God out of it. Whenever we look at the scriptures and we see people with this passion for life, this vibrancy, this joy, this meaning, this truth, this hope, the beauty, we also see people who have not embraced God as a force to be called on, but a relationship 
with whom they live. Before God calls you into conversation, he calls you into relationship. Once you're in that relationship, that leads to a particular posture, which is why I want to talk about the posture of prayer for a minute. Um, Whenever I pray, I always make sure that I'm on my knees, that my hands are clasped, not linked together like this, and that my eyes are closed. Really important. (laughs) Not at all. (laughs) Just some of you were like, okay, some of you took notes just now. Okay, I didn't know that. (laughs) No wonder he never listens. I've been praying wrong all these years, right? No, we're not talking about physical posture, right? None of that stuff matters. Really doesn't. Doesn't matter at all. So just first point there is doesn't matter how you're physically or postured. What we're talking about is, is the posture of our hearts, right? In fact, if you've ever been in a relationship, um, this, is, this is a very real thing. We have a posture towards people in relationship, right? If you've ever been in a relationship with another human being, which is all of us, right? You know what it's like to have a posture towards somebody. You can be closed, you can be cold, you can be resistant, or you can be open, you can be warm, you can be receptive towards them. When you have a posture that is closed and that person walks in the room, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter what they say, what they do, it doesn't matter how much they smile or how nice they sound, you are closed off to them. The posture is closed, right? But if a person walks in the room and you're open, there's this willingness to receive, That is the posture of a person who's in relationship with God. In fact, the the posture is is exemplified in Psalm chapter 1. The beginning in verse 1 of Psalm 1, he says this, and it's just this beautiful picture of posture. He says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff, and the wind drives them away. Now, I want you to notice verse 1. Blessed is the man. The biblical meaning of the word blessed or blessed is a word that means you have this deep joy and satisfaction and purpose and meaning and beauty and life. So this is somebody who has life. This is somebody who has the life of the Spirit. So the life of the Spirit is on this person. And notice that he doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, doesn't stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. Notice that. So he's, he's walking, he's standing, he's sitting. What are all three of those things representative of? Posture, right? So what's his posture? I want to point this out. He, to walk means you live your life according to something. It's like rules that you follow. So this person doesn't take their cues from, from the wicked. This person doesn't get their instructions for living from, from the broken systems of the world. So they're not following that way. They don't stand in the way of sinners. So, so the, the way, when we hear the way, anytime that phrase is used, we're not just talking about the, the path that you would take, but also the manner in which you would move down that path. And they're saying that this person doesn't move along that path in a way of brokenness, following patterns of brokenness and other human brokenness in our world. It, the person doesn't sit in the seat of scoffers, and I know you go, what in the world is that? Just picture the peanut gallery. These are the people that sit off to the sidelines, and they just criticize everybody who's actually in the game, but they're not actually in it themselves. This person isn't a part of that. Walking, standing, sitting, their posture is different. What is the posture of this person? Well, it says, he delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, when I was in third grade, I had to go to a Christian school for one year. It was miserable. (laughs) And they made me memorize. One of the first things they made me do is memorize this psalm. And I remember getting to this verse, to this part of it, his delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. And I remember actually thinking as a third grader, because you're honest when you're in third grade, I remember thinking, that sounds like a really boring life. Like, if this is what this whole Jesus thing is about, this sucks. Like, I don't want this. In fact, it sounds really unhealthy. Just, like, sit in your room and read. Like, you're going to get fat and lazy that way. Like, this seems really inconsistent. And so I struggled with this. And, uh, and it's easy to picture somebody sitting with a book, inactive, focusing on the words, right? But let me, just, let me just explain what's really being described here. And I want to explain this in terms 
that might help a number of us think differently about who God is. This might shift some of your thinking. In fact, if you were here a few weeks ago before Christmas, I talked about four different ways that human beings think about God, that we relate to God or talk about God as a being, as a hyper being, as the ground of being or God as event. Now, when we talk about God as a being, what we're, we're talking about God in the most primitive terms that human beings can think of God. It's kind of, it's kind of a primitive way to, to talk about him. And, and when we do this, what we're saying is God is a being who is very much like me. And when we say that, that starts to convolute our understanding of him. So, for example, we imagine under that mindset that God has a litany of choices every day and that his choices are just as complicated and nuanced with all sorts of understanding the way that ours are. So God has just a hard time trying to make a decision as we do. In fact, the reason, by the way, you and I all love routine so much is because we don't like having too many choices because it causes anxiety, we don't know what to do, and we're conflicted, is this the right choice, is that the right choice? And so when we view God as a being, we look at the choices God makes, and we're like, well, God just seems like he's uncertain a lot, right? Like God is struggling the way that we struggle, which means God's ways or God's laws start to seem a bit fickle. They start to seem a little bit unpredictable. When you start to move to a deeper understanding of who God is, that changes, because to see God as God really is, there are certain things that we see that are true and certain things we have to acknowledge about God. And part of that is not his inconsistency or unpredictability, but his consistency. So let me just give you, let me give an illustration or an example that, that describes this. Um, one of my favorite features of our city is the Spokane River. I love the Spokane River, absolutely. It's just amazing in so many different places of our town, so many different aspects of it. It's powerful, it's strong, it's a little bit wild at times, right? But there's also this predictability to it. Have you noticed this? The predictability is that it always flows from east to west, right? Like nobody ever wakes up on a Tuesday and they're like, oh, the river's flowing the other way today. Right? That's weird. No, that never happens, right? It never happens. And, and, and it, if you fail to re recognize that, if you fail to realize that it's always flowing in this direction, your life with the river can become very complicated, right? So if you go to interact with the river and you go to float it or swim it or fish it or do whatever you're going to do with it, and you're not recognizing that it always goes from east to west, you're not recognizing the flow, you're going to struggle in your interaction with it, right? There is going to be a struggle. But if you acknowledge it, if you see that the river always flows from east to west, it's always moving in this direction, there's a predictability to this. Now, when you interact with it, if you fish in it, float in it, swim in it, it now carries you. It's now easier to navigate. Now you work together. There is this sense of you entering into the flow of the river. Whenever I read in the scriptures the phrase, the law of God, I like to think of the river. That the God of creation has created things to work a particular way. There's a natural order to things. He himself, in his character, he moves and works consistently, predictably from east to west. And what we're reading about in Psalm 1 is a person whose life is oriented correctly to the movement or the flow of God in this life. It's a person who's looking, where do I jump in and how am I carried along? How do I participate in the direction that God is going? Which way is God predictably moving? He delights in the instruction and the wisdom of the Lord. And then whatever he's doing, wherever he's going, he's wanting to live in a way that is consistent with the flow that God is moving in. And so, so basically, what we have here are two kinds of life. You see, you see the outcomes, right? You, it says that one of these people is like a tree, strong and rooted. The other is like the chaff that is blown away. There are basically two kinds of people in the world. There are people who approach the river and they're just sort of ignorant of its flow. They just sort of get in and they're being blown over by it and wiped out by it. It's unpredictable and it's crazy. And then there are those who enter into it and they are carried along by it. There are those who lean in to God and there are those who lean away from God. There are those who are open to his direction and there are those who are closed to his direction. So when God calls you into conversation, into prayer, he's calling you to embrace his ways. He's calling you to, to live in a way that is consistent with the flow of his character and what he's doing in the world. 
So entering into prayer, it isn't this disjointed, sort of disconnected venture. It is us approaching the banks of this mighty river and we're seeing which direction is it flowing and now how do I allow my life to be moved or carried along? Are you with me so far? It's a posture. It's a posture that then leads to a practice. So, so we have the precursor, relationship, not just using God, but relating to God, open to God, seeing where he's moving, and now the practice of prayer. When we begin to understand this, we start to realize all of these things. Um, prayer changes. And, and prayer is not something we just do. It's not just something you check off, oh, I prayed today. It's not something you just like, do before a meal. I don't know why we get that, but... Um, it, it's an expression of who we are. It's who we're becoming. And it actually is the opening of this door into the wilds of who God is. But I want to demystify it just for a moment. Because I know for a bunch of us, I start talking about prayer and you're like, oh man, I get nervous. I don't know what to say. And you get nervous around prayer and it's not because of God. I'm convinced of this. It's because of people. It's because somewhere you heard somebody pray and they used thou and though and thus and thee. Like, they used all this different stuff and you're like, I didn't realize God spoke Old English. Like, <laughs> since when is that God's preferred language? It's Old English. Like I would have thought it was Spanish or something, but it's Old English, right? And, and, then, and then you start believing this. Like I guess prayer is about me presenting an eloquent speech to God and the more eloquent my speech, the more likely I am to be heard, right? So we get intimidated by this. But, but let, me just, let me just demystify this for a second. Let me, just, let me just say, based on everything we just talked about in the Psalms, nothing could be further from the truth. In fact, I just want to show you a little, a little teaching from the New Testament, the book of Romans. I want you to understand, like, there's this little church, an underground church that, that is birthed in Rome, this polytheistic sort of crazy pagan culture the church gets birthed, and the Apostle Paul, in the early days of Christianity, he writes a letter to this church to say, hey, here's how to start living this faith thing out. And so in Romans chapter 8, the 8th chapter, the 26th verse, he talks about prayer in a way that totally demystifies the way we think of it. Listen to what he says. He says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. So, I don't know if you got that, but what he's saying is it is less about words and more about your heart. It's not about you getting it right, but it's about God's Spirit meeting you. It's not about the words that you say. Um, last week, I had, a, I had a stress dream last week. Does anybody else ever have stress dreams? Yeah, everybody does, right? So I had a stress dream, um, ironically, about our upcoming Easter services. <laughs> I know that's a little bit weird. You're like, that's a little premature, isn't it? But it was because, I think it's because we had like 1,200 people show up to one Christmas Eve service when we offered six. And so it kind of created some stress around here. So next year we'll be changing our Christmas Eve service times. But um, I just have, must have had some built up, like pent up anxiety thinking about something that's, you know, four months from now. But um, I, I, was, I had this dream and it involved some staff members. And I was kind of irritated with one of them in particular in this dream. And, uh, and so I violated one of my own personal rules. And I'll just share this. It has nothing to do with the message. I have a rule for life. And it is this. I will not tell you about what I dreamt if you don't tell me about what you dreamt. Because if you're ever on the other side of somebody telling you their dreams, it's miserable, right? Like they go on and on and then we were here and then we were on Mars and then we were, and you're like, the reason you're telling me this is that it didn't make sense, which is why you shouldn't be telling me this, right? Like this is, this is it's always like the worst moment ever when somebody's telling you their dream. And so I have this rule, like don't tell people your dreams. They'll think you're crazy. They'll think you're crazy. Those are the two reasons, right? Like, just don't. So I violated my rule because it involved people, and it was Easter, and I thought, oh, it's kind of a work-related dream. So I came in here, and I started telling the dream, and about midway through me describing it, I realized that everybody that's listening and smiling works for me. So they have to pay attention. And so as I'm listening to them, I'm, real, I'm struggling. I've got this picture in my mind. I've got this picture in my head of the dream of what was going on and I'm trying to describe it and I cannot describe it. Do you know what I'm talking about? Like I, I, I can see it, 
but I cannot make myself sound like a sane human being in this moment. It is not going to happen, right? Now, why does that happen? It happens because words, words, language always follows pictures. It always follows images. We can always acknowledge something and see it for what it is, but then words are, are, are beyond that. They're, they're after that. Words come after ideas. Language comes after emotions. And so words, as much as I love words, as much as um, I love using them, they are inadequate in expressing some of the deeper things in our life, especially the more intimate they are, the more emotionally connected they are, the more complex they are, the more words fail us. Which I believe is what Paul is getting at in Romans 8. It's why John Bunyan said this. He said, the best prayers have often more groans than words. But if that doesn't make praying a little easier, I don't know what does, right? You don't have to say much. You just kind of make some noise, right? Jean Guyon, she said this, prayer is nothing more than turning our heart toward God and receiving in turn his love. Nothing more than turning our hearts towards God and receiving in turn his love. That is the essence of prayer. So let me just demystify it and throw open the door of possibility. When God calls you into conversation, he doesn't care where you begin. He doesn't care where you begin. He just wants you to step out the door and do life with him. In fact, Jesus, so many times Jesus, when he was teaching his disciples about prayer, he didn't tell them what to do. He told them what not to do. And he pointed to weird religious people who were turning prayer into a show. So the point is just just start, just have the conversation. And and as I begin, for me personally, as I begin down this journey of, of the relationship, of the posture, of just the practice of prayer, one of the things I'm always reminding myself of, the, of is this. And let me just share this. I, I, just, I say this to myself all the time. There is only one person in the entire history of the world who has selflessly and sacrificially, with no gain to themselves, given their life for me. Nobody. I got a lot of people that love me, but nobody other than this one person, which means there is one person that I can always trust has my absolute best interest at heart. It means that there's one person that I always know, no matter what you're telling me, you're not trying to sell me on something. No matter what you say to me, I always know this one person, you don't have mixed motives, you're not corrupted by your own past or experience. They are pure motives 100%, and that person is Jesus. Which means that when he says, hey, here's where you find life and truth, I enter into that relationship. I don't want to just lean on God like a force. And when, when, when he says, I want you to have an open posture, it means that I'm listening and I'm leaning in and I'm saying, which direction are you flowing? It means that when I start talking, I don't care what I sound like because this is somebody who loved me at my absolute worst. You've seen me at my worst and you still love me. So just talk, just open up my life, begin to do life with God. And I truly believe that when you and I open up the pathways of communication, it is the difference between black and white and color. There's a switch that happens. It's the Douglas fir in the middle of the storm. It's the kaleidoscope of all that God is doing. So I I know we mentioned last week, and I know that earlier John mentioned the 21 days of prayer and fasting. We just thought to ourselves, we thought, what would it look like if a bunch of us said, hey, let's start the year, and instead of just going on with our black and white routines, what if we threw open the doors to the cabin? And said, what would it look like for a bunch of us together to say, let's enter into 21 days of guided prayer and fasting. By the way, so next week we're going to talk about fasting, but you can start tomorrow. Um, And and so we we just put this little thing together. I went on our website this morning. It was actually really, really good. I don't don't mean to act that surprised, but it was really good. I was reading. I was like, wow, this is... This sounds better than anything I could have written. Um, So on our website, there's a little place you can click, and it talks about some principles of prayer. It talks about fasting. There's a guide that you can sign up to receive. Super good information. I signed up, put my email in there, so I'm going to get it. We get the Lectio Divina reading for the week, for the day, and then also some other guided points of prayer so that you can just start to practice this so that we can actually begin to live this out and actually live out our faith beyond a moment on a Sunday. Does that sound good? All right, would you stand with me? You can check out the website. You can stop at the Resource Center for Be With Jesus. As you go today, let me give you just an unusual benediction. Here we go. May you be brave enough to step out of the safety of the cabin. 
May you enter the storm and the wind of what God is doing in the world. May you climb the tree. May you experience God through fasting and prayer. Amen? Amen. 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 Guys, thanks for being here today. Hang out, talk to some friends, and we'll see you guys next Sunday. See you later.